good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. It's good to worship God together. Uh, a very special happy Father's Day to all of our dads in the house. Yeah. I know I speak for all of the dads when I say it is a, it's an honor. It's a privilege. It's a joy um, to hold that role as dad in the lives of our kids and in, in some cases our grandkids. I pray that God gives you uh, wisdom, that God would anoint you, that God would bless you, and that you would fulfill that vital role to the fullest that God has designed for you to fulfill. Amen? Um, so if you're here this morning, men and ladies, or if you're listening online, uh, everyone here knows what it feels like to wear varying hats in their lives. If I was to address the fathers this morning, I'd say, you know, guys, you know what it is to wear different hats. You've got the, you've got the dad hat, right? You've got the, maybe the grandpa hat, the pop-pop hat, right? Maybe you've got the husband hat. Hopefully you have that if you have the other two, right? Um, uh, you know what it is? Maybe you, have the, you, know, you know what it is to have the son hat and the, the sibling hat. You know what it is to have the employee hat and the employer hat, right? And the list, the list goes on and on. And with every hat that you wear, every role that you have, you're having to constantly make adjustments, right? Uh, you're having, having to uh, adjust your expectations on how you're going to steward that role. Now, I know, ladies, that, you, that you're here this morning, you're thinking, that's just the, you haven't scratched the surface of the amount of hats that I've got to wear in my house and in my life and in my, in my context. And the reality of it is every one of us are always wearing different hats, different roles, right? And expectations are oftentimes um, created based on the current hat that we are wearing. It's interesting, though, there's one hat that we all wear, um, that if we, we were honest and, and, and truthful this morning, uh, there are some times that this hat takes a back seat to all of the other hats that we oftentimes are, are screaming for our attention, and they tend to distract us from the prioritization of this particular hat. And this hat is the hat of being a disciple of Jesus. And I'm not just talking about being a Christian, right? Because being a Christian isn't a hat that you put on. It's the very essence of who you are, right? But when I talk about the idea of being a disciple, it's this idea of, of pursuing Jesus, of, of intentionally going after God's heart and, and being who he's designed for you to be, to know him, right? And it's that intentional pursuit of, of Christ uh, that defines our discipleship. The ironic thing is that when we prioritize our discipleship, our, our growing into who Christ has made us to be, every other role, every other hat that we wear tends to kind of find its, its proper place. And it actually tends to fuel those roles so that can best be what God has designed for them to be. Perhaps that's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and, and all of these other things will be added to you, right? Put Christ first, his kingdom, his righteousness first, and all of these other hats will be defined by that very thing. So this morning, we're, we're going to jump into uh, the middle of a family dispute. That sounds like fun, right? We're going we're gonna to jump right into the middle of a family dispute. Um, and we're going to see what we can learn from, from two sisters that are having Jesus over to their house for dinner. Uh, my hope was to bring what, what may be a very familiar story uh, to the table this morning and uh, see what we can learn about them with the hopes that we could perhaps learn a little something about ourselves in the process. The title of my message is Distracted Devotion. Distra Anybody ever get distracted? Anybody distracted right now? <laughs> now, if you didn't hear me just say that, then you are distracted. I want to pull you right in, right? So we're going to look at this idea of distracted devotion. In this scene, we have... Two sisters, a little bit backdrop, backdrop here. We have Mary and Martha, and they, and they had a brother whom, who many of you may know the name, but his name is Lazarus. He is the one that Jesus raised from the dead in John chapter 11. 
And it's interesting, we get some insight into Mary and Martha uh, based on that scene in John chapter 11 when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. We, we see a couple of things about Mary and Martha that may help us to uh, appreciate all the more this story that we're going to look at uh, in our text today. A couple things we know about Mary and Martha is number one, and most importantly, we see that Jesus loved Mary and Martha. Jesus loved Mary and Martha. We read about that in, in John chapter 11. As Jesus was entering to the scene uh, of, of where Lazarus was laid, uh, John lets us know right from the beginning that, that Jesus loved Mary and Martha. And we also see in that text that, that Mary and Martha were respected in their community. We know that because John records that, that many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to, to console them concerning the loss of their brother. And so we know that they were, they, were, they were known, they were respected in their community, and in their time of grieving, many of the Jews gathered together to comfort them. We also see that they were likely people of financial means. I mean, they had a home that was large enough, right, to host and, and feed Jesus and his disciples, right? And so if you're putting on a spread for 12 um, hungry men that are moving around a lot, you probably have a large enough home and enough resources to, to fully feed them. We also know that it was Mary who anointed Jesus with very costly perfume and washed his feet with her hair. So we don't know a lot about them. We don't know how old they are. There's no mention of them being married or widowed. We only, we only know that these two sisters, they live together, and we know that they love Jesus, and Jesus loved them. And so now as we come to Luke's gospel, we, we jump in on this scene of when Jesus was coming to their house. Luke chapter 10 and verse 38. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Perhaps a, a, a very familiar passage of Scripture to you, a quick read of this scene, uh, makes it very easy to draw uh, some conclusions and get the, 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 uh, the context of all that's going on, right? The company has arrived, right? Martha is scrambling to make sure everything is taken care of, right? She's wanting to make sure Jesus and his disciples are fed and welcome. And as she is scrambling and serving, she looks over and she sees her sister doing nothing, at least according to Martha. She is sitting at the feet of Jesus while Martha is breaking a sweat serving this group of disciples. Yeah, I read that passage and I remembered what it was like growing up in my home of four boys. We used to always host Christmas Eve and that would always bring the best and worst out of my parents. Um, the best came out after the company, right? The worst was there right about 15 minutes before the company arrived because it was like all of a sudden everything became known to us of what we needed to get done. And the reality is things haven't changed in my own home either, right? We do the same thing to our own kids, right? It's like, hey, listen, you know what? They're going to be here any minute, clean the bathroom, do this, do that. Like, and, and it causes all kinds of conflict because why? Because you tell the one, hey, will you do this? Well, what about Johnny? I don't see Josh taking care of his saying, hey, how come? Do you see anybody seen David? David hasn't seen anybody. Right? Nobody knows where anybody is and everybody. So we've all been in that kind of a scene where you're stuck feeling like you're doing all the work, right? And nobody else is pitching in. Now listen, if you've never experienced that, then you're the person, <laughs> yeah, that everybody gets upset about, right? So you need to listen in a little bit. <laughs> the reality is that Martha, who by, 
Let me just kind of point out before we blow up Martha. Martha was a woman of faith. You know, when, 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 Jesus, when, she came to, when Jesus came to her at Lazarus' tomb, it was Martha who said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would still be alive. I know you have the power. I know what you're capable of. So Martha was a woman of faith, right? And I think we're going to be able to identify both with Mary and Martha this morning. But Martha, at this particular scene, this particular day, Martha was wearing her hospitality hat. Not the disciple hat. hat. And she was experiencing what I call distracted devotion. Can you relate with that? You know, you know what you should be doing, but you're distracted from doing it. You know where you should be, but you're just distracted from being there. Or maybe you are where you know you're supposed to be. Your body is there, but your mind is somewhere so far. You've left the building. You've been distracted. We've all experienced that from time to time. And, and how many times, even when we gather together in God's house, nobody needs to raise their hand, but there's times, right, where it's kind of like, you know, in the midst of a song, a word will be sung or something will be said, and it kind of sends us on this web search. We kind of go off into the distraction mode. This morning, I want to take a look at this distracted devotion that we see in our sister Martha. Now, don't get nervous. I want to hide out. I want to point out 10 things that I see in this story here that helps us to appreciate what they're going through and may even set the stage for us to appreciate what, what we go through from time to time. The first thing we see about this distracted devotion is, number one, she was distracted with good things. I mean, that's what the scripture says. She was distracted with, with much serving, right? Martha was focused on serving Jesus. I mean, she, I mean, even Jesus said, the Son of Man hasn't come to be served, but to serve, right? And so she's following her master. And so if Jesus is going to serve everybody, certainly that's kind of like what she's, the pattern she's following. But this day was a little bit different. This obviously, the expectations for this visit were very different. And so she was distracted by a good thing. Serving is a good thing. Serving is a, serving is a godly thing. Serving is what we're all called to do. But what we see happening here in, in Martha is she was so caught up in serving for the Lord that she missed being with the Lord. And that's what happened, and, and, and that, but not Mary, right? Mary's at the feet of Jesus. You know, as we consider the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, when Jesus is correcting the churches, he says to the church at Ephesus that, man, you're doing a lot of things right. I'll just paraphrase it, right? You're spotting false, prophet, apostles, false apostles. You're exposing lies. You're doing great works. You're doing wonderful things. I only have one thing against you. You've left me your first love. In the midst of your doing, in the midst of your churchianity, you have failed to embrace me. You forgot me, your first love. And I want to go on record and say that that's, every one of us are capable of that. Some, can, can I just tell you, sometimes it's easy to hide behind service. It's easy to hide behind going to church. It's, e it's easy to engage in good things and forget about the good one that is worthy of our undivided attention. Devotion to Jesus is what guards our hearts from being distracted from Jesus. Additionally, your distracted devotion lends itself to questioning God's care for you. Distracted devotion lends itself to questioning God's care for you. This is what happens to Martha. The second thing we see is she questions Jesus' care for her. Look at verse 40. It says, Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Don't you care? Aren't you, are you seeing what's going on here? Don't you even care? Clearly, you, don't you see my face? Some people hide it really well. Some people just don't, right? Don't you care? This happens every time we get our eyes off of Jesus and onto the problem. 
So as soon as we distract our eyes off of Jesus and we look on the problem, just like Martha, we wrongly assume God doesn't care. When our devotion is distracted, it's very easy to assume that God doesn't care when things don't go the way we think they should go. Sometimes we have our own plan for our life. We have our own strategy, our own way in which things are supposed to go. And when those things don't line up, we go, don't you care? Mary wasn't the only one that came to that conclusion when crisis came, or Martha, rather. We read in Mark chapter 4, a great story. Jesus sends his disciples out for a boat ride. He's like, hey, you know what? It's, it's, it's get in the boat, head on over to the other side. Mark chapter 4, we read, and, and when, they were at the, when they were out there, it says, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling, but he, Jesus, was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? Could you imagine what that scene must have been like? I mean, the waves are coming in, the boat is filling with water, the disciples are freaking out, and there is Jesus asleep like a baby. <laughs> Things weren't going the way they thought they should be going. And notice the first reaction. Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care that we're perishing? You see, sometimes... Sometimes we, we define God's care for us by the comfort we experience around us. Sometimes we define God's care for us by the comfort around us. And when the comfort around us isn't so comfortable, we question God's care for us. When in reality, sometimes God is using that discomfort to grow us in the midst of it all. But for Martha, she quickly concluded that Jesus didn't care about what was going on because her focus wasn't on Jesus. Where was her focus? Her focus was on Mary and what Mary wasn't doing. Third thing, thing I see here is distracted devotion causes us to look at other people. All right? She's, she's looking at Mary. We see that in verse 40, right? Hey, my sister has left me to serve. A distracted devotion always causes us to focus on what others are or aren't doing. The moment we get off our eyes off of Jesus, we become very aware of what everybody else or is or isn't doing. And that's exactly what we see taking place in Martha. Why isn't she helping? Doesn't she see things need to be taken care of? Doesn't she realize that the cups need to be, you know, put a certain way? The dusting needs to get, I mean, doesn't she, Jesus, don't you care? Distracted devotion causes us to look at other people and, and never, never in a very fair or favorable context, by the way, right? We're, we're always the victim, and they're always the one leashing, unleashing it out. A distracted devotion always causes us to look at other people, which makes us feel like we're alone, which is the fourth thing that I see in Martha. Distracted devotion makes us feel alone. Look at verse 40. My sister has left me to serve alone, all alone. How many have had that pity party one time or, or another? It's only me. I'm the only one. It all right. Everything rises and falls on me. If I don't bring it, it doesn't happen. Where is everybody? It was the idea of feeling alone that caused Martha to draw all the wrong conclusions. It was that unnecessary burden she bore that everything had to be perfect. Everyone needed to be okay. Everybody's needs needed to be met that day. And in her mind, it was all up to her to pull it off. And she felt like she was there to serve alone. We do that, don't we? You ever spiraled in your head and drew all the wrong conclusions about people, about events? Do you ever have an argument with somebody and not even in the room? Honest question, did they ever win the argument? No. 
They never win those arguments. You walk away feeling pretty justified, right? Why? Because I'm alone. I'm alone. Martha felt alone and concluded that it's not right. She concluded that it was unjust. And she felt it quite appropriate, number five, to tell God what to do. There's a fifth thing we see here. Martha tells God what to do. Jesus, tell her to help me. Isn't that great? Here's what you need to do, Jesus. I'm upset. You're not doing anything about it. So let me tell you what to do. Distracted devotion causes us to put ourselves in the driver's seat and tell God what to do. In fact, this seems to be a little bit of how Martha seemed to be wired a little bit. As I mentioned before, when she came to see Lazarus and, and, and he had already died, Martha's words to Jesus was, hey, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. We read in verse 3 of chapter 11 that they called for Jesus to come and heal their brother. Jesus, if you would have just done what I told you to do, hello, my brother would have been alive. But you know, Jesus had a far greater plan than just healing Lazarus. Instead of healing Lazarus, he raises Lazarus from the dead, and he uses that miracle as a platform to declare, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. Jesus had a much better plan in place. He didn't need Martha to tell him what to do. He had a much better solution in mind for Lazarus that day. And it wasn't the solution that Martha wanted him to do, by the way, right? Go and heal my brother. That would have been a little bit anticlimactic because Jesus was healing everybody those days. But it wasn't what Jesus had in mind. It wasn't what Martha had in mind. Which brings us to the sixth thing I see, I see here, that distracted devotion presents solutions to God. It tells, we tell God what to do, and then we tell God how to do it right? She presents solutions to God. Tell my sister to help me, right? Here's what you need to do. Tell my sister to help me. Jesus, here's what you need to do in case, in case you haven't figured it out. Maybe you're distracted by everybody else going on around. So I'm going to help you tell my sister to come and help me. Have her kick in, will you? Because I'm getting a little frustrated. What's sad about the entire thing is that while, Mount, while Martha was stewing, Mary was enjoying Jesus, sitting at his feet. I'm sure Martha had that same, I'm sure Martha had that same look on her face that the disciples had on that boat that day when the winds were roaring, right? And the waves were coming in, it was bo- and the boat is filling up with water, and they look. And there he is, sleeping. I'm sure their face looked very much like Martha's face that day when she is scurrying and sweating and serving. And she looks, and there's her sister, not sleeping like Jesus, but sitting at Jesus' feet doing nothing. While Mary was at peace and present with the Lord, we see that, that that wasn't the case for Martha. That wasn't Martha's reality. Because the seventh thing we see here is that distracted devotion results in a lack of peace. She was missing out on a wonderful opportunity. Look at verse 41. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. Martha was anxious. Martha was troubled. You see, what was going on in the room that day was bringing out some stuff on the inside of Martha. Because notice what Jesus says here. He says, Martha, you are anxious about many things. In other words, 
It's more than what you see going on, right? This was the, this was the last straw, right? This, was the, this, this is the one that, that broke the camel's back, right? It kind of, this just opened up the floodgates when she saw her sister sitting at the feet of Jesus. And she is frustrated, and she is hurt, and she is feeling like a victim, and she is feeling alone, and she is anxious, and she is troubled. And Jesus says to her, you're anxious about many things. And I love how Jesus responds to her. Here's what I love about Jesus. Jesus doesn't blow her up. Jesus loves on her. Martha, Martha. Not Martha, Martha, Martha. No, 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 no. It, it, was, more, it was more affection. It was, it was more understanding. It was more compassion. Martha, Martha. It speaks of tender care and, and love. And what he does is he ultimately, he, he invites Martha to engage him, just like Mary did. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that sound like our Lord, right? How does, God, how, does, how does God present himself to the distracted disciple? He invites us to partake of him with our undivided attention, right? We are invited to come and come boldly to the throne of grace. You know, another thing we see here is, number eight, that Mary, Mary had a choice. Mary had a choice. Yeah, you know, she could have caved into the pressure and, and the looks and the expectations of her sister. How I many know, I, I don't have sisters, but my guess is that there are some looks that were probably being exchanged between Mary and Martha before it all blew up, right? How many have sisters? Am I, is, it, is, that, is that what happens, right? That's what I understand, right? And what I love about Mary is, I'm sure there were looks, I'm sure there was like, you know, huffing and puffing, but I love the fact that Mary doesn't cave in. She didn't allow the expect, expectations of her sister to pull her away from the expectations of Jesus, who invited her to sit and be with him. You know, sometimes we allow the fear of disappointing other people to cause us to neglect our devotion to Jesus. You ever done that? I've, I've done that. I'll say, man, I'm going to set this time aside to be in the Word or in prayer, and then the phone rings. And there's a need, and it's a legitimate need. I'm like, all right, boom, I get pulled over here and I get pulled over there. I mean, it, it happens. We all, we all experience those moments. And, and here's the problem. We don't want to disappoint other people. But all the while of doing those good things, we're missing out on the best thing because we're not in the presence of Jesus. And when we're in the presence of Jesus, then we can be what all those other people need for us to be. Distracted. Mary had the same choice as Martha. And Mary chose the, the good portion. That's what Jesus says. Mary's chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. I love that. This wasn't the only time that Mary chose well. As I mentioned before, there was another time where, where Mary would, would sit at the feet of Jesus and this time would be different, though. This is nearing the end of Jesus' ministry. And Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus, and now she is anointing his feet with costly perfume and wiping his feet with her hair. Total devotion to her Lord. Anointing those feet that were soon to walk the dusty road to Calvary where Christ would come and pay the price for our sins on the cross. Mary chose well. Mary chose well. Martha had a choice as well. Ninth thing we see is Martha had a choice, and the same choice that was offered to Mary. 
Hey, she chose the good thing. And listen, Martha wasn't sinning, by the way. You know, sometimes, we, sometimes we get so caught up on, well, is it a sin or not? This isn't a matter of sin. It's a matter of good or best. Right? Martha chose a good thing. She just didn't choose the best thing. And sometimes we, we, need to, we need to realize and we need to weigh out whether our time is being spent in the good or the best. Because the 10th thing we see here is that Jesus said that one thing is necessary. One thing is necessary. And Mary chose it. Mary and Martha had the, they had the same opportunity. They had the same guest. They had, the, they had the same invitation. They had the same relationship with Jesus, the same history. They had the same choice to make. Martha chose to be distracted in her devotion for Jesus. Mary chose to prioritize her devotion to Jesus. And Jesus said Mary had chosen the right thing. She chose the right door, the right curtain. She chose well. She chose the good portion, the best thing. And notice what Jesus says. Jesus says, and it will not be taken from her. What is he saying? What does that mean? Mary was sowing into her spirit while Martha was being consumed by her emotions. Mary was sowing into something that she would take with her for all of eternity, being with Jesus. Martha was being distracted by the temporary frustrations. And Jesus says that Mary spent time, his, her time with Jesus would, would last forever. It will be never taken from her. And his, his response to Martha is nothing less than a, an invitation to do the same. Distracted devotion. We, there's not a person in this room who doesn't experience that from time to time. We all struggle to not get pulled from one side or another. How many times you're, I mean, here, here's what it looks like, right? right? I'm going to spend some time in prayer. God, thank you. Hey, it's Father's Day. Wow, Lord, thank you that you are my father. And thank you, Lord, that I am a father. Thank you for my sons. And you know, bless me. And thank you that we're going to spend the day together and we're going to have a barbecue. And I want to go to that butcher in Rocky Point and get those, <laughs> those steak tips that Christine brings over all the time. I haven't had those in a while. And you know what? Those sausages would really be good too. I don't know if I have enough, I don't know if I have enough propane in the barbecue tank to continue that. I, I, are they open today? I don't know if they're open today. I love the fact that Chick-fil-A is closed on Sunday, though. Those are really, those are really good. And, you know, I wonder if those Chick-fil-A, because it's a Christian organization, I wonder if it's less calories. You know, does it really count if we're supporting a Christian? And all of a sudden, you are so far from where, can anybody, please help me, can anybody relate with that story, right? Distracted devotion. Aren't you thankful that God is patient and merciful with us? Right? He loves us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to keep us that way. And so he preserves this story over the centuries for us to learn from Mary and Martha so that we choose well, that we not get distracted from the most important things. I, like you, am on a journey towards Christ-likeness, and sometimes in the midst of keeping my eyes fixed on Jesus, I tend to get a little sidetracked. But I thank God that God, the Holy Spirit, gets my attention and pulls me back. Here's my encouragement to you. Don't beat yourself up but also don't give yourself permission to get lazy. Keep moving forward, right? When you drop the ball, pick yourself up, brush yourself off, and go hard after the heart of Jesus. Because when he becomes our priority, everything, everything seems to fall into place. 
What is it? It's not a call to churchianity. It's a call to Christianity where Christ is the center of it all, right? And what does that mean? It's a call to simplicity. It's a, it's a call to pursuing the heart of God. Going after the lover of our souls. Responding to him in love and relationship. We've changed the order of our services around. I don't know if you've noticed the last couple of weeks. We, we, we kind of cut the worship a little shorter in the front so we can revisit it back at the end so we can respond and set some more time responding in worship to God's word and allowing the Holy Spirit to allow that word to marinate and then begin to apply. Because here's what happens. Now that we've kind of covered these things, now the Holy Spirit begins to help us to know where they apply in our lives. And we have opportunity to say, all right, God, here's, here's the changes I'm going to make. Right? This is called transformation. And so, would you stand with me this morning and as I pray, Father, um, thank you for your goodness, for your faithfulness. Lord, thank you for the invitation to come and, and come boldly. Thank you that we who were not a people are now the people of God. And you invite us as your people to be in your presence. And Lord, we, we do that with glad hearts this morning. Lord, help us and forgive us of those moments where we've allowed ourselves to get so distracted or settled for the good at the expense of the best. Lord, it's not in our heart to do that. Help us to follow hard after you. Thank you that we are your workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And Lord, as we surrender our lives to you, would you give us the grace to grow more and more into your likeness. In Christ's name we pray. Let's worship God.